Well, indeed, the country's relationship with China has been both a boon and a bane. Joining us to weigh in are world trade expert Jemai Gatula and security and defense consultant Jose Custodio. Jose, Hello. let me begin with you. Hello. There you have it. Yeah. Ja, Zhao Jianhua, Chinese ambassador to the Philippines, saying, on the one hand, we do not negotiate, but on the other hand, we are hoping for a new chapter in relations with the Philippines. What do you make of his comments? Well, basically, it's the same situation that we've had with them. That's why. All our, all our talks have been failing since 1995 when they have, they have refused to budge from that. They don't want to compromise. They just, it's like, it's ours and that's it. And so I assume that I would say that if the next administration goes optimistically into um, discussions with China and it has that framework that if it talks with China, then it would result in a win-win situation, it will be in for a big disappointment. I mean, when you, I uh, guess, Jose, when you look at it, right, if, if the mm -hmm. tribunal does rule in our favor yes. also, and China maintains a trial set, what, what, uh, what, what uh, fail-safes are there? What mechanisms are there for us to enforce? Is, there, is this decision enforceable, or will we need also, say, help from, from the international community to help enforce this particular decision? Well, the um, thing decision? is, the international community is there to constrain China, okay, to make China behave. You're never going to have these things dismantled. They're there to stay. All those artificial uh, structures are there to stay. Uh, the Chinese will, however, have to be restrained from becoming more abusive in what they intend to do with this. Um, especially this uh, particular feature on Scarborough Show, this particular uh, claim that they have on Scarborough Show. Because if they decide to ramp up their activities there and do something like what they've done in West Philippine Sea in the Spratlys Islands, then can you imagine the strategic um, impact of that on the Philippines? Because it is barely 120 nautical miles away from our centers of gravity. Our commerce is all there. It will be restricted to 12 nautical miles away from uh, our, our, uh, from our um, centers of gravity. You just leave Manila Bay, 12 nautical miles, and that's Chinese territory already. That's, that's what's going to happen. So. Now, Gemma, I know you've been a keen observer of this as well, and I want you to weigh in. Of all that we've heard from the five presidential candidates, did anyone stand on China? Well, stand out for you? Is there anyone? Well, the, the jet ski one was... was well, that out. was pretty <laughs> controversial but, but, and yeah. hilarious. That was Mayor Duterte, of course, saying mm -hmm. that he will jump on a jet ski and plant a flag, the Philippine flag, on Scarborough Show. Or is it Vice President Binay's insistence that there is a common ground to be found here. Actually, when you look at all the five presidential candidates, well, let's just say four, uh, the, the jet ski one we, we disregard. But, but for now, with regard to the other four, they, they seem to be taking some sort of a, a, a combined approach. When you really look at it, all of them simply boil down to, yes, we will talk with them, but at the same time, there's a need, a recognition of the need to be able to bolster up our, our forces, our, our military, uh, with the understanding, uh, belatedly, unfortunately, that you just can't talk without the ability to enforce your talk uh, with something uh, uh, with something like uh, akin to a force. Um, having said that, Grayspo has articulated a very good vision on how to deal with, with China. On the other hand, she may have articulated it well, but the problem here is the execution. Um, you would like to also to be able to look at the person who has the experience and the ability to execute that policy, however articulately it may have been envisioned. Uh, and just one thing to add to, to our, our friend here, the, the, the thing with, with our ability to deal with China is actually a, a ruling thing. Sometimes we make assumptions of cer certain things that we have wished would have happened five years ago or things we would assume that ha we hope would happen uh, three months from now or six months from now. Unfortunately, the, the terrain changes. Um, she, for example, Premier Xi, for example, is facing some sort of domestic issues. The Panama Papers have been some sort of it's coming giving up him tomorrow problems. morning, actually. Yes, and at the same time, China's economy uh, is facing certain challenges. Now, whether or not it's going to pose a, a lot more complexity for the Philippines is something that we will have to mm -hmm. deal with eventually. But definitely, we need a president who has the intellectual uh, flexibility and, at the same time, the experience to be able to deal with these things. Go ahead. Yeah, I've noticed right. is that um, many of our presidents before, like even uh, the current one. He talked strong on China before, okay? Um, then he vowed for full modernization and so on and so forth. But the problem is that China is not the only threat that the Philippines has. So um, problems like internal insurgency, problems like uh, even humanitarian assistance and disaster response have eaten into the defense budget and the capabilities of the military and even has resulted in um, confusion in the AFP and what exactly is the role of the military. Is it uh, in, in, in the midst of all of these challenges affecting the nation. Okay? 
And um, be, uh, that being said, you would see that there would be budgetary problems happening or in funding certain things. We wanted to have jet fighters or, um, or light, uh, or what do you call it, uh, fight, lead in fighter trainers um, on a much earlier um, schedule, but we had all of these uh, things that inter. Um, well, here at Bloomberg, we did yeah. crunch the numbers and we found yeah. that there's obviously, you know, it's D a David and Goliath story, really, mm -hmm. a budget for defense is at its highest in many years. Still, it's nothing compared to China's. And, and that's where the international community comes in, or that's where the arbitration Here we go, case world military begins. balance for this year, yeah. according to IHS. Here we are at 50, 555, 50, 555 million. million. Yeah. That's right, in yeah. China, well, they're still at record here. What I've noticed is that that affects many of our policymakers because they tend to think of the Philippines and China, but many of them fail to realize that you also have the international community or many in this region who are actually a bit irritated, to say the least, with what China's been doing. You have Japan, Australia, uh, Indonesia actually just blew up some Chinese fishing vessels. So um, we're not alone. And I think um, the issue of the arbitration case is to establish legit legal or establish a legit legitimacy in our position. And then with that, you also had the hard power, which was the EDCA turning Balikatan into a multilateral activity because we had all the Australians. Um, and then tomorrow, uh, maybe next year, we will have the Japanese. Granted, of course, there are no four massive, uh, significant foreign policy changes in the incoming administration. I'm uh, glad you brought up uh, uh, involvement in the U.S. and Australia. But given the, the situation, how many more players are coming into it, is there a possibility that more players could come in and maybe complicate the situation for the worse for the Philippines, for instance? Well, for me, basically, uh, the more players you have, then it tends to overstretch China. That's why China doesn't like bilateral, uh, doesn't like multilateral talks. They don't want to be overstretched. I mean, they picked a fight with practically almost all of their neighbors, except for Cambodia and Laos. But almost everybody else is... Um, um, They've been has aggravated. A, has a, yes, aggravated. China does, and its resources are stretched thin. So the tactic of bilateral approaches to is um, for them, it's advantageous for them. So I think that um, if we handle the multilateral approach positively or or create or proactively, then we can have a, a better um, uh, stand against uh, China. That is, if you don't. Well, 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 if I just may add on that particular aspect, the thing here is that we shouldn't make the mistake of thinking that if there are other players here in the region, these other players will be moving in one unison. Yeah. That's right. Um, they will each be acting on their own ASEAN particular hasn't interest. Come to an agreement. And interest. even ASEAN itself is actually diverse. Like a multilateral players put his dilemma yeah. in some yes. sense. And, and not all of them will be, and most necessarily, probably, it will not be in line with Philippine interests. The other thing is that I would like to go back to the budget. Um, those figures that you mentioned are actually quite huge, but when you really look at it from the overall perspective, they probably just constitute 4%, 5% of the Philippine budget. It's incredibly um, deficient. The, the number of military officers that we have probably stretches all the way back to the Second World War in terms of the numbers territorially required. Um, considering all the problems that have been mentioned here, the, 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 the Islamic threat and what have you, this is woefully inadequate. And this is something I've always kept pointing out from the very beginning. A president has simply one job, and that is to ensure that the, the Philippines is protected. All others, essentially, is a bonus. Mm -hmm. But right now, I think that's one particular aspect that we have been woefully lacking. Jemai, we're going to parse that angle a little bit more in a little